Welcome to EBNEO Journal Club, where we highlight conversations occurring through our social media channels around studies we curate. For our hashtag followers, this is where we discuss EBNEO alerts generating interest by our NEO EBM community. Today we have Shovik Mitra and Nick Bamet along with myself, and we'll be talking about this non-inferiority trial evaluating PDA management by Sung et al. that generated a lot of conversation on our channels when we posted this in June. So I'd like to start by uh, bringing Nick in here and, and tell us a little bit more about non-inferiority trials and, and, and what they are. Thank you, Ravi. Um, in a typical trial, the hypothesis is that the intervention and the comparison differ on the outcome of interest. Um, often we want to know if an intervention is better than the comparison. In contrast, in a non-inferiority design, the question isn't whether the intervention is better than the comparison, but whether it is no more than acceptably worse. Usually acceptably worse is being considered because the intervention has some secondary benefit or appeal. For example, it could be less costly um, or easier to use. So in this study, the authors ask, is non-intervention no more than acceptably worse compared to oral ibuprofen on the outcome of death or BPD? The secondary benefit seems to be avoidance of a pharmacotherapy with known adverse effects. Um, non ferity trials typically do have active comparisons, so that makes this a little bit atypical. Thanks, Nick. So, you know, you get to kind of know more than acceptably worse. So I wonder if you could kind of talk about how that's set and how that's defined in trials and then, and then maybe how it's interpreted. So the non-inferiority margin quantifies uh, no more than acceptably worse. In the example here in this figure, the margin is set at a risk ratio of 1.2 in favor of the active control and an inference of non-inferiority can be made when the upper bound of the 95% confidence interval does not cross 1.2, as is the case in the first three of the five examples that we have in this figure. In the trial that we're discussing today, the authors chose a 20% absolute difference in death or BPD as their non-inferiority margin, thereby allowing a conclusion of non-inferiority non if the confidence interval doesn't cross um, that margin. Thanks, Nick. And, and you know, one of the things we kind of thought at and we asked our new EBM community to give input on is, is kind of what is tolerable in terms of no more than acceptably worse? And this was just an example tied to this trial, which is what, what would you tolerate in terms of um, an increase in the risk of death or BPD, where most of the respondents really picked a relatively small margin. So I wonder if you could touch on kind of how do, how do researchers set these margins in, in trials like this? I think the key point to emphasize is that in non-impurity trials, the investigators are setting their own goalposts. So it's important to scrutinize these goalposts and ask yourself, whether it aligns with what you as the provider um, or the families would consider acceptably worse. There is some published guidance for setting non-impurity trials, but it's difficult to apply in most scenarios. And so the results of our poll here would suggest that um, most respondents feel that a non-impurity margin of 20% greater death or BPD uh, may be somewhat lenient. Thanks, Nick. So let's bring Shovik in here and, and walk us through now getting into a little bit more details about this study. Walk us through how the study was designed and what the um, investigators reported. Thanks, Ravi. So this was a randomized non-inferiority trial where preterm infants less than 30 weeks of gestation with a PDA of more, uh, uh, more than 1.5 millimeters and on breathing support between 6 and 14 days of age were randomized to non-intervention or treatment with oral ibuprofen at standard doses, that is 10 milligrams per kilogram, followed by two doses of five milligrams per kilogram every 24 hours. Their primary outcome was death or BPD. And as Nick discussed, uh, their margin for non-inferiority was no more than 20% increase in death or BPD in the no intervention group. Now they had randomized 146 infants and what they found was that 
debt or BPD was 6% lower with no intervention. They were 95% certain that debt or BPD could, be, could only be as much as 11% higher to 22% lower with no intervention as compared to treatment with ibuprofen. Now, since there was only a negligible chance that debt or BPD could possibly be more than 20% higher uh, with no intervention, therefore, as per their definition, no intervention was non-inferior to treatment with ibuprofen. Or to summarize it in very simple terms, in preterm infants with a symptomatic PDA, not treating a PDA is as good as starting treatment in the second week of life with standard dose ibuprofen. Thanks, Shavik. So uh, one, one of the things that one of the members of the Neo-ABM community, Abdul Razak, who's now one of our social media editors, brought to light were some of the um, potential issues with this trial that might influence its interpretability. So I wanted to touch on point one here um, and get your thoughts on kind of how the definition of hemodynamically significant PDA was in this trial and the implications of that. Yeah, so the definition of PDA in trials has always been a matter of debate. Now in this trial, any infant less than 30 weeks with a PDA of more than 1.5 millimeters who otherwise could be stable on very minimal breathing support was also included. Now this might create a highly heterogeneous population as in many of these infants, the PDAs would close off spontaneously without much effect on outcomes. Now by including such babies in these trials, we might be creating a lot of noise and might lose any signal for benefit in uh, those who are at the highest risk of PDA attributable morbidity. For example, the micropremps with a large and significant and symptomatic PDA. Let's touch on point four here, which is about the dose, the dose that was used in this trial compared to potentially other dosing ranges used and how that might influence the general eye vote. Yeah, so the issue of dose is, is an important one to consider as well. Now, if you look very closely at the results, only 20% of the PDAs closed with ibuprofen. And if you look at the results in less than 26 weeks in this trial, the PDA closure rate was only 8%. Now, if you compare that with other published literature, the PDA closure rates with ibuprofen ranged from like 60 to 80%. Now, you might wonder why is this this huge difference? One important factor to consider here probably is the, uh, is the timing of treatment. Now, most of the earlier studies that found a good response with ibuprofen treated the infants much earlier, around the median age of three days. But now there is more and more evidence that with increasing postnatal age, higher doses of, uh, of ibuprofen are required to achieve similar therapeutic levels. So it is not surprising that when standard ibuprofen doses were used in infants more than a week of age, only a small fraction of them close their PDAs. So we really have to ask ourselves the question, did we actually compare elimination of a PDA shunt at a week of age versus no intervention? Or did we just compare mere provision of treatment, which was grossly suboptimal versus no intervention? And apart from the non-inferiority margin issues that Nick mentioned, is this another reason why the two interventions ended up being very similar. Well, thanks Shovik for putting that in context and Nick for, for touching on non-inferiority trials. And so we, we do want you to please continue the conversation around this trial using the hashtag EBNEO Journal Club across of all of our EBNEO social media channels. And we're gonna be continuing this. Our next Journal Club will be coming to you early next year. And thank you to everybody for, for watching today. Mm -hmm.